Please turn to the book of Zechariah, please. Chapter 1, beginning in verse 12 this evening. As we have introduced the book last week and some of the background of the book, uh, we've emphasized the fact that we are now in the uh, period of return from captivity. The various minor prophets uh, re, uh, prophesied during the various periods that we've talked about. We've talked about the ones who prophesied during the divided kingdom when the northern tribes of Israel had separated from the southern tribes of Judah. And so there were prophets for both the north and the south. And then uh, the northern nation went into captivity to Assyria. Judah stood alone. There were prophets then to Judah, warning them that they also would go into captivity if they did not repent. Eventually, that's exactly what happened. And so they went into captivity. The prophets during the period of captivity were both uh, Ezekiel and Daniel, were both major prophets, so they're not included in our study of the minor prophets. And now we're in the last period when they returned, <coughs> excuse me, from that Babylonian captivity. Excuse me. <coughs> so let's review some of the themes of these prophets that we have studied. We talked about the book of Hosea, which compared the uh, unfaithfulness of Israel to the unfaithfulness of Hosea's wife, Gomer, who was unfaithful to her husband. The prophecy of Joel used a locust plague to illustrate Israel's need to repent of their sins. Amos uh, comp compared the sins of Israel to the sins of the nations that surrounded Israel. Obadiah was a, really a prophecy about Edom, the nation to the south of Judah, uh, saying that they would be punished because they had rejoiced in the fall of Judah or in the, in the uh, affliction of Judah. The book of Jonah was also a book about a prophecy of another nation. That is, he was to prophesy, prophesy against Nineveh, the capital city of the uh, uh, Assyrians, and he didn't want to do it because they were an enemy, and so God used the, the great fish and the plant to teach him that God cared about the people of Nineveh. Micah then uh, was a prophet to Israel and Judah, and he described how God put them on trial for their sins. Nahum again returned to a prophecy of Nineveh, saying that Nineveh would fall. Zephaniah was, or excuse me, Habakkuk, uh, Habakkuk questioned the punishments of God. We'll talk about, more about that this evening in which he wondered why God would use an evil nation to punish uh, God's people when the evil nation was in any way, if anything worse than the nation that he used, and God said he was going to punish that nation as well. Now we bring these last three, Haggai, we talked about how that God, uh, excuse me, Zephaniah rather, uh, another prophecy of God's punishment to come against Jerusalem and then Haggai, uh, that when the people returned from captivity, they should rebuild the temple and now we're in Zechariah, and we have talked about the theme being the, the future glory of God's people. So where Zechariah uh, will make some references to the temple, uh, whereas Haggai was primarily about rebuilding the temple, Zechariah is primarily about predicting the future and what would come in the future. The first six chapters are visions, and we will uh, look at those visions. Uh, we've already begun, of course, the first one, and look at the second uh, this, this evening, and maybe into the, the third. And the last few chapters are prophecies about Judah and her enemies. Again, the future of those, uh, na those uh, nations. So let's look at our visions. We started in chapter one of Zechariah, the vision of the horses among the myrtle trees. And we haven't finished with that vision, at least not the explanation of it. But through verse 11, what have we learned from the vision so far? Tell me something you've learned so far from the vision of the horses among the, the myrtle trees. Uh, Jason, please. That God knows what's going on. All right. All right, so the various horses represented the idea of God. These were looking at the world and reporting that everything was at rest, everything was at peace. They re in essence, reported that to God, which is symbolic. The visions are symbols. The symbolism was, as Jason said, God knows what's happening in the world. And in this case, he knew that the nations were at peace. We're going to see some more about that, though, as we continue in dis discussing the, the vision and the other visions. Okay? So that's what we are now. But now there's more to it. So any questions or comments before we proceed from verse 11? 
Well, let's go ahead and read then uh, 12. Let's read uh, 12 through 17. We'd like to read chapter 1, verses 12 through 17 for us, please. 12 through 17. We'd like to read that for us, please. Bill, please. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which you were angry these seventy years? And the Lord answered the angel who talked to me with good and comforting words. So the angel who spoke with me said to me, Proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for for Zion with, with great zeal. I am exceedingly, exceedingly angry with the nations at each, for I was a little angry, and they helped, but with the evil intent. Therefore, says, says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall we build in it, says the Lord of hosts, and a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem, again proclaiming, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, My city shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion, and will again choose Jerusalem. All right. So now we see there's more to the explanation of the vision than what we covered last week. And that we find that the, the angel who was there to help Zechariah understand the, the vision, uh, has some questions, and this, the angel is very helpful. Helps us, not just Zechariah, helps us to understand what these visions are about. So we have this angel who was there, uh, and he asked a question of God, the angel does, in verse 12. And uh, what's his question? What concern does the angel raise to God in verse 12? Okay. How long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and Judah? All right. He wants to know when God is going to show mercy to uh, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. And in particular, how long had it been in his question that God had not been showing them mercy? Debbie? 70 years. 70 years. And what's that talking about then? The 70 years is what? Captivity. Well, that's a bad one. Captivity, isn't it? They've been in captivity 70 years, just like we've been studying, and they've returned from captivity. So the question that the angel is asking, in effect, is when are you going to end the punishment that you sent the people into captivity? When are you going to end the punishment and the, uh, the, the distress that you're causing and show mercy instead? Okay? Questions or comments on the question that the angel is asking? Jason. 70 years would have gotten rid of one generation of people. They would have, they would have entered in and then it would have wiped them out and then their children would have come up. Okay, pretty much that's so. Now we already learned in the book of Haggai that some people lived through the, the whole period of the captivity, uh, but that would be true of just about all of them, wouldn't it? Uh, but there were some who survived. And nevertheless, uh, what God has done here is he has punished the people and they've learned some lessons. So the question is, okay, now when are you going to show mercy? However, remember, uh, Zechariah is uh, living and prosper, uh, prophesying in the year of King Darius. Okay, so which means, verse chapter 1, verse 1, which means some of the returning from captivity has already begun. Okay, so it's not as though nothing has been happen, has happened, and as we learn in the book of Haggai, some are responsible to rebuild the temple. So there were three groups of, that went into captivity. Three different groups returned from captivity. So the returning from captivity has begun, and so the question now being asked is, what mercy God is going to show uh, for those who have returned at the end of the, the period of captivity? Other comments on verse 12, questions? Uh, Terry. Well, I think it's interesting to see that the angel that's talking to Zachariah wants to know this. I mean, he's interested in, in what's going on on the earth and what God is doing on the earth. Okay, and why do you, 
Why do you find that particularly interesting, Terry? Well, it shows that it's possible that the angels are watching what we're doing, and the, the scripture, and I can't bring it to mind where it is now, um, where we're instructed to, uh, it's, it's, it's an instruction to women about being careful because of the angels. Okay, first one is 11. It just was an interesting Okay, well, I, yes, and I'm just, I, 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 I think it's interesting too. I just wondered if you, what your reason was. Yeah. Yes, the, the truth is, the angels don't know the future except as God would predict it and tell them. And so, and 1 Peter 1 also talks about that fact that, that they don't know, didn't know even in the Old Testament times about the fulfillment of the gospel, the death of Christ, and so on. They observed it as it happened. Okay, and so the angel is interested uh, in the meaning of this uh, vision. Okay, at right, verse 13, let's go ahead and uh, look at God's response. We'll take 13 and 14 first of all. What does God answer to the angel? Verse 13 and 14. Bill. He answered in good and comforting words. All right, comforting words. So, well, and more in particular, in verse 14, what are some of these comforting words about? What does he say as he gives comfort? Verse 14. Uh, Frank. Uh, he said, God said that I am jealous uh, for Jerusalem and Zion. Okay. Okay, all right. Uh, so, it is zealous or jealous, depending on your translation, for Jerusalem and uh, Zion. What's that mean? What's he trying to express by that? Velma. His strong love for them. His strong love for them. All right, he's his love. So, I. It seems like his answer to the angel is, it's be, it's changing. Whereas he has been punishing the people and sent them into captivity, they've come back now. Now he's beginning to show blessing to them. He's, he's going to give them reward and care for them in, in ways that he hadn't been doing during the 70 years. Okay? So there's a change because of the change in the people. Okay? Other comments on verse 13 and 14? Uh, Susie. Well... Um, the word jealous or zealous uh, is an interesting word to me because it's not a, it, it's used in a way that we don't use it today I don't think we use it more as we're envious uh, of someone where this is used more of as a, um, a husband feels toward a spouse or a spouse would feel towards their mate that they're jealous uh, about them because of their great love for them and uh, their desire to to have them. Um, so I just found that interesting too. Okay, and we've talked about that before in the prophets, haven't we? With regard to God's jealousy um, for, first of all, for himself as compared to the idols. The fact that it wasn't a bad thing that God was jealous when the people would worship idols uh, because they, he had no right to worship idols they were to uh, restrict themselves to worshiping the true God. And so God, in a similar sense, has a, a zealous or jealousy for Jerusalem and, and Zion. Uh, he is, doesn't want them to be mistreated by other people. He doesn't want them to be unfaithful. Uh, and he cares about them. Okay, other comments to verse 14. I know verse 15, I think it's especially to the, uh, the point of the vision so he's answered the question. He's saying, okay, I'm, he's, he speaks comforting words. Uh, he's zealous. He's <coughs> jealous for Jerusalem. But verse 15, what else does he say in answer to the question? By the way, we're on verse question number 22 now. How, what else does he say in answer to this angel's question? Verse 15. Karen. Um, he's angry with other nations. Okay, 
So whereas he's zealous, jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, he's angry with other nations. Why? And what nations in particular? He doesn't name them, but we know what they are, Rick. Well, from what I've seen is like Babylonia. He used Babylonia to do his will, but Babylonia didn't turn to God. They didn't have anything to do with God in the long run. Okay. All right. So he says, verse 15, I'm exceedingly angry with certain nations. And he gives, the first one he says they're at ease. He says, I was a little angry and they helped, but with evil intent. All right. So what does he mean when he says they were a little angry and they helped, but with evil intent? In what way did these other nations help? Susie. Well, they, he... Uh, he was angry with his people, with um, Judah, because, but, and he wanted Babylon to punish them, but Babylon went beyond. In Isaiah 47, 6, it says that they showed them no mercy, and Jeremiah 30, 11 says that uh, God meant it to punish, but the nation's uh, intent was to destroy or to uh, dis extinguish uh, Judah. So they went beyond what God was intending for them to do. Okay, they went beyond what he said or he wanted to do, and what else does verse 15 say about it? Not only did they do worse than what God wanted, what else does it say about it? Evil intent. Evil intent. Okay, so they didn't have the right reason. God wanted it as a legitimate punishment of his people for their sins. But Babylon and Assyria with Israel, they didn't do it because they cared about what God wanted. They did it for the sake of their own power and wealth and taking spoils and that kind of thing. They were in it for themselves. They weren't in it to please God. They had the wrong reason. They were evil nations. Back to the book of Habakkuk, where Habakkuk asked, why do you use an evil nation to punish your people? And God's answer was, I'm going to punish the, these other nations too. We're back to that point now in the book of Zechariah, where God is telling uh, through the angel to ultimately to Zechariah and to us that uh, these other nations are going to be punished because even though they'd helped, they'd done some things he, he wanted done. As Susie pointed out in the scriptures, in some cases they went far beyond what he intended, but beyond that, they didn't have the right reason. They didn't have the right motive for it. Okay. Other comments in verse 15. All right, now there's another point, very, I think, important in verse 15. He says they are nations at ease. What does that have to do with the vision? Remember, we're still explaining this vision of the horses. What does the fact that these nations are at ease have to do with it? Jason. They would have been profitable. There would have not been no struggle. They would have been living well. Okay. Off the backs of maybe his own people. So. Okay. And that's not what God wanted. What was it that the that the horses, the riders of the horses, said when they observed the world? What did they say about the world? Sure. It was resting quietly. Everything's quiet. God didn't want everything to be quiet. You would think, well, that would be good, but in this case, it's not what God wanted because there were some people that shouldn't have been resting quietly. They needed to be punished. And so that's the connection, it seems to me, to the vision. The horses them come back then. They've seen the world. They say that they're resting quietly. God said, I'm going to do something about that because here are some nations that don't deserve to be resting quietly, and they're the ones that mistreated his people, acted for the wrong reasons, and so on, and so that's the ultimate lesson where this vision is going. God's going to punish those other nations, just like he told Habakkuk he would. Okay? Other comments through verse 15. Okay, so verse 16 and 17. Uh, first of all, question uh, six, uh, 23, question 23 and verse 16. What does God say he's going to do? Bill? He's going to return to Jerusalem where his house will be built. All right. 
returning to Jerusalem, from the house of be returning with mercy. Okay, so here's the answer again to the angel's question. Now there's going to be mercy. Where well, there had been punishment, now there's mercy. And they're building the house, just like we studied in Haggai. Uh, the Haggai and Zechariah were teaching the people to build the house. God said his house is going to be built. Uh, and he says the surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Now we're going to read about that surveyor's line most more in uh, the next chapter. Okay, so if you want to have a comment now, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll talk more about that when we get to chapter 2. Questions, comments, 2 verse 16. Okay, so verse 17. He says that they, it should proclaim from the Lord of hosts, what? What does he say in verse 17, question number 24? He makes it a further promise about uh, the people and the Zion and Jerusalem and so on. What more does he say? Terry. The cities will overflow with prosperity, and I will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. All right. Prosperity, comfort, and God will choose Jerusalem. Remember those prophecies before God was going to reject them. And his spirit left the temple because the evil of the people. He's going to choose them again. He's going to comfort them. They're going to prosper uh, because they've been punished and they've returned. And God is now again uh, jealous as zealous for uh, Jerusalem. Right? That's the explanation for the first vision. Question, comment, discussion has on the first vision. All right, so we summarize then, right, on my chart, uh, the meaning of that first vision is that God would bless Jerusalem but punish the enemies who had in turn punished Jerusalem, Judah. Okay? Other comments? But right, now we get to the second vision. So let's read the second vision, verses 18 through 21. Who'd like to read, excuse me, 20, yeah, who'd like to read the verse 18 to 21 for us, please? Chapter 1, verse 18 to 21, the second vision. He'll read that for us, please. Neil. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there were four horns. So I said to the angel who was speaking with me, What are these? And he answered, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. I said, What are these coming to, coming to do? And he said, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man lifts up his head. But these craftsmen have come to terrify them, to throw, the, throw down the horns of the nations who have lifted up their horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter it. Okay. Now, I notice he says at the beginning of verse 18, I raised my eyes and looked. Now, when you see that in uh, Zechariah, that means a new vision is beginning. Okay, he's raising, seeing his, he's something, he's going to describe something he's seeing. I guess you have the second vision then. So here's, here's what he sees. And beginning in verse 18, what does he see? Rick. He's seeing four horns, which from what I've seen, horns always notify the power of authority, a government, someone over authority and has power to do damage to you. Okay, so you've pretty much dealt with question 23 and into question 24. He sees four horns. And so, uh, as Rick pointed out, horns are significant, are in prophecy, often signify uh, power, rulers. Okay, and I gave you some examples, some scriptures there in question number 26 to help illustrate that. Uh, anybody remember what those passages in Daniel chapter 7 in particular, how he uses the word horns to illustrate rulers there. Anybody remember what that, did you look that up and what did you, what did you learn from that? <laughs> Susie. Well, uh, in Daniel, uh, he talks about the fourth beast being terrible, dreadful, exceedingly strong with iron teeth and ten horns. Um, out of which came the little one. <coughs> and ten horns were ten kings. Okay. So the ten horns in Daniel 7 represented ten kings. So that one explains it for us, you see. 
So when you find passages like that explain these kind of symbols, it helps. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to mean the same thing in other passages, but a lot of times they do. In this case, they do. So the horns, in this case, there's four horns, uh, and they represent kings or kingdoms, powers, and so on. Okay? Um, and we'll see more explained about it as we go along then. As in verse 19, because uh, Zechariah asked the angel. What does he ask the angel in verse 19, and what's the answer? Verse 19, what does, what does he ask, and what's the answer? Susie. Um, well, he asked, what are these, and what's the meaning of it? And he says, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Okay. So he says, what are these? You see that? That's a question we would ask too, of course, and see that's, we're getting the explanation now of the vision. There's four horns. What are these? And the answer is, these are the horns that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. In other words, they're the nations, the kingdoms, that took the Israel and Judah into captivity. Specifically then, Assyria and Babylon, and other nations were involved in it too. The nations around, that we read in the Minor Prophets, the nations around uh, Israel and Judah also joined in the destruction and the, uh, so forth. So these are the nations that did this. The horns, the nations that did this. Okay, so that's the answer what they are, but we're not through with the vision. Okay, questions, discussion through 19. All right, but there's more to the vision than verse 20. What else did he see in verse 20? And now we're in question 27. What else did he see? Frank. Four craftsmen. Four craftsmen. Okay, now you've got four horns. They represent the, the powers that, that punished, that took into captivity, Israel and Judah and so on. But now we've got four craftsmen. In verse 21, the question is, what are these? And what are they going to do? And what's the answer? Verse 21. What do the craftsmen represent? Uh, Terry. Well, it says they're going to terrify and cast down all who lifted their horn uh, against Judah and, and scattered it. So it's the ones that will punish those four horns. Okay. See the connection back to the first vision. The first vision, God said that he knew that these nations that had, had uh, he'd used to punish Judah, and as they'd been at rest, but he wanted them to be punished. The second vision, and now we see that the horns represent those nations that had punished Israel and Judah, but now God has four craftsmen that are going to destroy those horns. They themselves become like horns that attack the horns, the nations that punished uh, Israel and Judah. Okay, so they uh, so they, their horns. It says the craftsmen are coming to terrify the horns that scattered Judah, and to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah. Okay, so these are the craftsmen that are going to punish the people that uh, punished Israel and Judah. Okay. Questions, comments? So here you see we've got the, the second uh, vision, the four horns, the craftsmen, Judah, Jerusalem's enemies are going to be punished. Uh, Sharon? Wouldn't that again imply that God is now on Jerusalem's side if he's punishing Jerusalem's enemies again? Exactly like the first vision said, that God was going to speak words of comfort now to Jerusalem and Judah. It's the enemies now that are going to be punished, just exactly like God told Habakkuk what happened. Okay? Other comments on the second vision? All right, so the visions kind of build on one another, you see. All right, it's the first one that the, the enemies of Israel and Judah deserve to be punished because they didn't do what God wanted, or at least not for the right reasons. Now we begin to see, okay, they're going to be punished in the second vision, uh, the symbols of the craftsmen. Anything else to the second vision in chapter, end of chapter 1? Okay, and let's look at the third vision. Now we get to chapter 2. Uh, so let's read chapter 2. Verses 1 through 5. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. 
Who would like to read chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 for us, please? Chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. Rick, please. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. And there was the angel who talked with me going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him, who said to him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls, because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I says, for I says the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Okay. Now verse one, I raised my eyes and looked. Well, okay, that's another vision beginning, you see. He raises his eyes and looks. Okay, we've got another vision. It's starting now in verse 1 of chapter 2. And first of all, verse 1, what does he see? What, is, what appears in this vision? Uh, Steve? Uh, measuring line. And a man with a measuring line. Remember, we talked about that surveyor's line, that measuring line back in chapter 1. That was part of the earlier vision, in fact, in verse, chapter 1, verse 16. Well, now it's going to tie into this, this vision, you see. The visions tie to one another. Here's the man with the, uh, the, the measuring line, the surveyor's line. And what are you going to do with it? Verse 2. What are you going to do with that measuring line? It's Bill. He's going to measure Jerusalem to see the width and the length of it. All right. He's going to measure the city of Jerusalem, the length and the width. Now, this is symbolism. It's a vision. What's the significant? And there's this kind of symbolism is used in a number of other passages uh, in prophecy. What's the significance of measuring a city or what a country, whatever nation, whatever? What's the significance of measuring it, the length and the width? Susie? Well, it's spiritual application. <clears throat> God's going to be uh, measuring their, their righteousness. In Isaiah 28:17, he says, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Okay, uh, so it's, it's in a form of judgment. It's a form of uh, taking, taking their measure, but not physically. The man is with a measure line, you would think is physically measuring the length and the width of the city, but it's, it's a symbolism. God is measuring the people, measuring the character, uh, and in the indication of what, what the nation, the city is like, okay? Other comments? All right, now again, remember this is symbolism and sometimes it gets a little bit difficult. But the angel, now he's still got the angel with him, verse 3, you see. Uh, and, but there's another angel that comes, verse 3. And what is the outcome of that? What are they told to do? What is some, one of them, I'm not sure which one it is, but it doesn't matter. What is somebody told to do in verse 4? Uh, Karen. Um, they're to run and tell him that Jerusalem would be inhabited as a town without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock. Okay. So they tell the man who's going to measure the city, Jerusalem will be inhabited like a town without walls because it has so many people and livestock in it. It'll be like uh, a city without walls. But then let's tie in verse 5 to it as well. What else does God say in verse 5? Rick. Well, it was a half back in when the city was built for it to have walls around it to defend it from outside sources. That God, in his vision here, says, the Lord will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. So he's going to protect her himself. Okay. All right, so God is going to be the protector. So the man was going to measure the city, length and width, but God tells us to tell the man that the city is going to be like a city without walls. So much, so many men, so much livestock that it's going to be like a city without walls, 
but he's going to protect it. He'll be its walls, its protector, and so on. Okay? So what's the message? What's the purpose then of the telling the man with the, lot, with the measuring line this? What's the message to the man supposed to mean? Karen. Uh, Jerusalem will be back in favor with God, and God will uh, protect her. Okay. Okay. Uh, comments? What does that have to do with the measuring line? Jason. Well, it mentions an abundance of people. There's prosperity again. There's a good living. They're, they're faithful, and there will be great joy. In it. <clears throat> okay. A, me a measurement, a, a great measurement, evidently, so. Okay, all right. Frank, what were you going to say? I thought your hand was up, Frank. I, I was thinking uh, of measuring their faithfulness, their righteousness, okay. just making uh, God's judgment uh, determining their, their faithfulness to Him. Okay. All right, other comments? All right, so it's hands. Rick? In Revelation chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. So it does have to do with the number of people. Okay. Other comments? Terry? Well, we know this is tied to the coming of the Messiah and the change in, in God's people. The idea that came to me was the idea of the, the city expanding beyond the walls and God would be its protection. That it, his people were not going to be just those within Israel, not just those within the city walls. But it was going to expand. It was going to go it's beyond that. Yeah. And and there wouldn't be a God would be the protector then. There wasn't going to be the same need for the physical protections that they had had as God's people um, before the Messiah came. Okay. Um, all right. It seemed to me that the application to the young man is that you're not going to be able to really measure it. If they had walls, you could measure the walls. With, so, with, so, but this is going to be so large, it's going to overflow those walls. And you're not going to be able to measure it. Again, to some extent, Terry's point, it's going to spread and, and grow so much so that uh, it's going to overflow the walls and the size of the city. But, uh, yeah, because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. Okay. Now then, the, the question then, back to Terry's point, is what's the application of that? Was that a, is he talking about physical Jerusalem when he talks about this? Or is this spiritual regarding the New Testament and the church and the, all the other nations that would join in as well? Susie, comment? Well, could it be both? Because okay. it had to have some application to the people at the time uh, for them to find some comfort in it and the temple was going to be rebuilt and God would check them physically but it has a messianic um, application also. Okay, so, but not only was they, were they rebuilding the temple, what was going to happen to the walls of the city of Jerusalem? Physically. They were rebuilt too. In the time of Nehemiah, those were going to be rebuilt too. So physically, Jerusalem was going to have walls. So it seems to me that while God is giving comfort to them, there's more, it seems to me, to this prophecy than that, that physical, because this was going to go beyond that, be, spreading beyond that, as which would be in the New Testament then, the spreading of the gospel, the salvation of souls, and Terry's point, even from other nations as well. And remember, this is where Zechariah is going. He's made the point, okay, the enemies are going to be punished, but look beyond that to the future when we have the blessing of the gospel and the, the New Testament 
uh, and the covenant and so on. Okay, any other comments on verse 2, verse 5? Terry. Well, this would include the idea of uh, the Gentiles becoming a part of that Jerusalem in the New Testament, you know, of God's holy city. That they weren't allowed in Sign the temple area. They weren't allowed in um, in this kingdom that was being protected by the physical walls. But now, uh, what's coming is going to open the doors, and the walls won't be necessary because God will protect who comes within His kingdom from then on. Okay, and remember, we're not through. We just read through verse five. We're not through with this vision yet. And as we get through the, in the rest of the chapter, more of the vision, we're going to see more about these other nations that are going to come and be part of Jerusalem as the uh, fulfillment of the prophecy. Any okay, other comments or discussion through verse 5? Okay. Now, I didn't assign past verse 5, but let's go ahead and read some of it. And uh, we'll look at some preparation for next time then. Let's read... Um, well, let's read 6 through 9. We won't be able to discuss it all. Who would like to read chapter 2, verse 6 through 9? Chapter 2, verse 6 through 9. Who would like to read that for us, please? Frank, please. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Up, escape to Zion. You who dwell with with the daughter of Babylon, for thus said the Lord of hosts, after his his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of my of his eye. Behold, I will shake your hand, shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those who save them. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. All right. So in verse 6, he um, continues describing now this same vision. And what does he tell the people to do in verse 6? Flee. Flee. Okay. And flee from where? Babylon. From Babylon. From the north. Babylon is actually northeast, but they. It's always from the north because that's how they would access Israel because to come around the, uh, the rivers and so on and come down to Israel. And said, verse 7 then says, Escape you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. So they're to leave the captivity. Remember, it started. Some have already left, but there's some others that have not left. And he's wanting them to take the warning that they should leave uh, because what had God done to them in verse 6? What had God done? And he's telling them not to leave. What had he done to them? Susie? He'd scattered them abroad. He'd scattered them among the nations. Scattered them abroad to the four winds of heaven. Now we've seen this number four several times, haven't we? How, where did the horses go? How many horses were there, either, I should say? How many horses? four horses and the horses went where everywhere but the whole earth the four represents then what we would say the four directions the four corners of the earth the four directions everywhere okay so the horses looked everywhere and saw that everything was at rest now then four horns in the, the second vision uh, People from various areas came and punished uh, the people. God was going to punish them and scatter them with the four craftsmen. Now we've got four, uh, the four winds of heaven where God has scattered the people. Now they should come back to the Lord. All right, Terry, then we'll have to quit. Does the fact that the world was at ease also have a connection to the fact that God's people were not coming back to Jerusalem even though they were allowed to. Some had made their homes in Babylon and were willing to stay there. And God wants his people to come home. 
So even their ease seems like it wasn't satisfactory to God that they were at ease where they were. They should have been wanting to come back to their homeland. All right. Hold Terry's thought, and that's where we'll start in our discussion next week as we discuss the application then of this vision as it goes down through chapter 2. Thank you very much. We'll take up then as we continue in chapter 2 for next time then. Thank you.